Is there all the descriptions and stuff there? Hmm. Good. We're live. Are we? Yeah. I mean, I can't see us. No, so this is something new that we're trying is I, we can pick our own comments here. Uh, so we get to see the comments together on that screen. You don't get to look at yourself anymore. My good looks? It's probably best because then you just be looking at yourself the whole time. Uh, so that's what I do all the time. All right. Well, you guys are totally throwing me off. I sit down and everything is gone. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, uh, welcome. Hey, guys. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, Aspiers TV. It's a uh, special edition Friday. Special edition Friday. Like I said uh, last week, we did not get our uh, video done for the hybrid series. Oh, they yeah. are about half done in editing it, fully written, uh, edited, shot, the A roll, and everything. So, uh, yeah. I mean, I gotta be honest, dude. Without seeing myself here, I don't even know it's working. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. We're trusting yeah. Carlos back there. All right, Carlos says it works. It must. All right. I, I mean, he sees comments. Oh, there's some comments. There's some comments. Hey. Oh, I see him. Yeah. Right, I mean, how do y'all? All right. Well, now I trust it. I now guess we it works. Hey, if the comments are here, that means our people are here, and that means we're here. Okay. All yeah, right. I mean, talk so, about RODI too. You know, one of the things we talked about was calcium reactors last week, and so you know, one of the things they didn't really hit on a whole lot. Part of uh, tank chemistry this week was the uh, salinity. You know, I talked a little bit about it, but you know, we didn't get super far into like out of top offs because you know, frankly. There's really just one that I buy all the time. You know, that's really the only one I ever use. But, kind of, you yeah. know, uh, that's not the only one out there. There's new ones coming out. Yeah. Ultimate guys coming out uh, are already out. And I uh, thought we'd talk about it a little bit. So why do we uh, maintain salinity, man? Shoot. Uh, well, I mean, the natural ocean doesn't fluctuate salinity as much as our tanks would in our own house. So if you're talking about a stable environment for the living things that we're trying to keep, uh, it's, I mean, just imagine my, I mean, imagine myself by breathing air, you know, if my oxygen was constantly in flux like this, how well I could survive, yeah, probably, probably go salinity like really too. good moods, terrible moods. Yeah, it'd oh. be like a roller coaster, so, yeah, so. Yeah. Alright, well, I mean. Yeah, so the reason I, I wrote it down in there is basically salinity controls every element in the whole tank, you know, and in the beginning I think most people are guilty of topping off the tank like, you know, once a week. Mm. You know, so they let the evaporated water go down and they see it and, you know, pumps are sputtering or something and they dump some more water in, you know, that's kind of, if you didn't know any better, you know, that's kind of the way people did it. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, the thing about it is you could be evaporating a gallon or two a day, you know, and so by the end of the week, man, I lost 10 gallons of water in my 100 gallon tank. Now everything, all the levels just went up. So as the water evaporates, the salt didn't go anywhere. It just yes. gets more concentrated, more concentrated, more concentrated. And then all of a sudden I go and I dump 10 gallons of water in. All of a sudden it's not concentrated. This is about but as far like from that. stable yeah. as possible. You know, so levels are going up and down uh, all, you know, willy nilly. And you might be said 10%, like, oh, that doesn't sound like a lot. Well, 10% of uh, 420 means that uh, depending on which way you went, it could be, you know, calcium level of four, like 65 or mm -hmm. like 380 or something. So, you know, it is a pretty big window uh, that goes up and down. Like, 10%. Yeah. yeah. And like, it doesn't even think 10% is that much, but if I told you your calcium was 380, it's like, oh, I got to fix that. Yeah. You know, uh, so yeah, it, it does matter, man. Uh, and, you know, it could be as a point of one, almost a point of DKH as well, depending on where you're at. You yeah, know, that's an important yeah. one I think that we, we hit on today in our meeting was uh, the, the balance between alkalinity, one, one point of alkalinity DKH to the calcium level in the mm -hmm. tank and how it's a, seven times amount of calcium mm -hmm. uh, as alkalinity in the tank. So you imagine like, so sure, your alkalinity drops from nine to eight, uh, which is pretty significant. One DKH is pretty significant. Two DKHs is pretty significant. But if you're only monitoring, like that's why it's important you were talking about in the meeting that it's important to monitor alkalinity and kind of why we do more so than anything else. Because, uh, you know, like you said, 420 to four, well, what is I'm it? Gonna, I'm gonna butcher the math four, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, I think, you explained it really well. I think if one DKH falls in your tank, mm -hmm. The equivalent calcium for, will go from like, so if you went from like eight to seven, uh, the yep. equivalent calcium would go from 420 to like 413. Yeah, you know, seven, which isn't even like seven, measurable. Seven parts per million, yeah. Yeah, like a test kit doesn't even like, is doesn't have an accuracy window. I think what about even like if you went all the way from like 2DK, from like uh, seven to five, yeah. man, that would be bad, right? But calcium would actually drop to like, what, uh, 406? 
like right on the edge of whether or not you can even test for it, you know? So like, uh, there's just a lot, lot more calcium in there. But so anyway, uh, what we're doing here today is we're talking about, you know, salinity for the most part mm -hmm. and making sure that we're keeping it stable. So I just thought we'd talk about a couple of auto top offs here, man. You know, I mean, I know I full well this ain't the most exciting conversation in the universe, <laughs> but you know, it's just one of those things that's important to talk about. And so rather than, you know, expand a 40 minute video or, tra or um, uh, all the elements, major, minor, and trace elements, and throw up salinity in there. We'll just do a little uh, live talk about it. Yeah. So everybody knows, I mean, if you've been watching BRS TV for, you know, like more than five minutes, you know that I love the uh, simulator. And the number one reason that I love the simulator is because uh, in all the years that I've been reefing, it's never failed me. In, uh, the, in the on position. In the on position, yeah. It definitely has gotten dirty, like yeah. uh, covered in algae in some tanks or whatnot, and been off Just and need to be off. clean. Yeah. I don't care about off. Man, off, the bubbles will Safe. come and tell me that I need to add it in there. Mm -hmm. I, I shouldn't say I don't care about off, but off is not my concern, like in a, to a major degree. On is like yeah. just overflowing my tank with uh, water, especially if I use any chemicals in that water, like kelp water or something. Mm -hmm. Bad news. So, you know, for me, I've been using these things. I don't even consider it anymore. Even like, you know, like Aaron came in the other day and he wants to put our top offs in all the tanks in the in the lab. You know, there's just dozens of these things. And they're like, a couple hundred bucks a pop. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm like, man, dude, I'm doing the math. Like, it's a couple grand. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, uh, Andrew's gonna kill me. But go put them on, man. Because, uh, like, what are we gonna do? Uh, I mean, I gotta let, let the tanks, like, overflow and, and not only, like, destroy, you know, and it, I mean, I'm only into this for like three months, you know, because we're doing, you know, experiments and stuff back there. Yeah. But I don't want to start with three months over, you know, much less a tank that I've got up for three years. Start that. Oh, that's insane. So, uh, you know, for me, that's what we're doing. We do it every time. This is why. I mean, there's features in their thing. You know, you can talk about all of them have eight billion different mm -hmm. sensors nowadays and, you know, different learning programs and all this other stuff. This thing has a few different uh, deals on it. One's got an optical eye on it. Optical eye works, uh, and it, it has no moving parts, which means it's not susceptible to salt creep or a snail holding yeah. it in place. Yeah. Uh, really, any moving part in salt water, uh, especially at the edge of it, salt creep, major, major problem. So this thing just has a, a, an optical eye on it. You know, lots of them have optical eyes. This one I trust the most, it, just because it works. And then a failure point is just a float switch that if for whatever reason that optical eye, I've never had the uh, float switch have to actually function before. And then even beyond that, it also has the uh, timer in it. So it's, it's, like it's like 10 minutes, I think. Yeah, it's like a 10 minute delay timer or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. Also, you know, and then Shuts like little off. features and stuff, man. It comes with the pump. There's a, you can turn the pump. If you take the top off, you can change the speed at which the pump runs. You can also use it with a solenoid if you want to hook it directly up to your RO system. I like that with some part. other features. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, uh, another thing, well, so if you're like the solenoid, and kind of like we, we did on the 160, and that's something move, going forward in, in my future tanks and stuff, I've used it, I've, this is the first one I've ever owned, the only one I've ever owned. Uh, I've used it with Kalkwasser in ATOs, uh, those little utility pumps, if you can keep them up, suspended up out of the sludge at the bottom of your ATO reservoir, that can last quite a long time, but even then, uh, I had my pump at, I think it was like four years of using this thing. I had to replace the pump one time, and it's like 25 bucks or something like that. So, but uh, I mean, the dual magnet. So the the one thing I'm going to switch to after seeing the 160 is the solenoid, which uh, is just plug into the the head unit for this. Is just replace that that pump, and now you can separate this little float switch from the optical sensor like we did in the 160. So it's you know space it out a little higher than whatnot, and. Uh, can hook your RODI unit straight up to your tank with a couple other layers of redundancy, like a float valve, mechanical float we have valve or float something. float valve so. in there. We also have a little, like, uh, level, kind of level lock. But oh, that flow, flow, flow lock. lock. Yeah, yep. the flow lock thing. It's a little sponge in there that, like, expands if it touches water and mm -hmm. switches a valve. A couple of different redundancy. I, we have, like, this tank, we haven't filled up the uh, ATO reservoir in ever. Yeah. You know, like not one time because there's no ATO, uh, ATO reservoir. It's just yeah. an RO system just replaces the water. You know, so yeah, absolutely. So enough talk about the oscillator. Uh, you know, what I'd like to do with those, if you have any questions about the mm -hmm. oscillator, man, or anything we're talking about, shoot them up. You know, uh, anything, you know, oddball, your experience with any of this stuff, yeah. man, shoot it up for everybody to see. I've got, oh, you got some questions? Got, yeah, I mean, we've got a couple here. Um, all right. Uh, we might have to have Carlos figure out how to get it back I think, to what I think I was you just hit that at. red deal, man, the ghost. But uh, here we go. Uh, Jake Jake is uh, asking, oh, we're playing, there's, we're playing this one. What's the most redundant ATO? 
Mm. Uh, I think it's, you know, I would say it's the, the, uh, the redundancy that you build into it. Um, I mean, like, so the Neptune ATK has uh, like three levels, three layers of redundancy uh, built into two optical eye sensors and then the, the built-in mechanical float uh, valve that's built onto the bracket. Uh, plus, I mean, even further, if you attach it to like a Neptune Apex, because then you can get, you know, program, you can get alerts, you can do things, you know, based off the sensor level. So, and then there's like the IQ fill with the ATK. So, I mean, you're all in all, if you want to count them as layers of redundancy, that's like maybe five or four or five or three or what have you. Three, four, five. The ultimate ATO came out. It's got four optical sensors built into it. They call it four levels of redundancy. Uh, but it's like I said, for me, it's as much as you build into it, like the redundancy of having a solenoid uh, or you know having a solenoid built down or down here maybe a solenoid before the whole RODI unit so you're maybe double solenoid the flow lock is a layer of redundancy the mechanical flow valve is a layer of redundancy the, the switch the optical sensor I mean, you could build a, as many as you want into these types of things more or less I'm gonna go ahead and throw a different kind of mindset into it too man so there's redundancy like uh, how many features does this little box have or the little box that's inside this guy you know but at the end of the day dude like it's a board in here, you know. So yeah. you know, no matter what sensors you got attached to this board, the board fails, the whole thing's done. Uh, you know? true. So yeah, like, true. Uh, it isn't redundant if it's just uh, one piece of technology. So there's like a couple of different ways to look at that. So you know, I like to look at redundancy in terms of you know redundant technology that like kind of builds on itself. So within the board. I'd say there's like three types of redundancy. A, there's like a timer-based redundancy. So, mm -hmm. you know, it turns off if it runs too long, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you can just adjust the flow rate of the pump to match, you know, so it doesn't, you know, you know overflow into your tank. Yeah. And uh, then there is a sensor, you know, redundancy. Like, uh, actually, this would probably be the primary one. But, you know, with an optical eye, there's no moving parts, you know. Uh, the things that would make that fail being algae growing on it. Uh, probably wouldn't make the f moving part or the moving part fail like a uh, film of algae or, or you know you know foam detritus or whatever on it yeah. would, probably wouldn't make it fail so the difference is between the timer fail the difference between the optical uh, uh, fail and the difference between the moving part fail these are redundancies that build on each other there's not just you know 15 different optical eyes is the redundancy right yeah, true and so you know beyond that though like start to think about redundancy of like well okay so all those things are actually attached to some board you know and if the board fails the whole thing fails and mm -hmm. you, you know so it doesn't matter how many sensors attached to a faulty board so something like a float valve you know so the float valves are those things that you know most of us have like stuck in our you know water storage unit for our ro system if you're, if you're smart after you've yeah. wet your floor right? after you spill on your floor like five times, times you definitely bought one but <laughs> you know uh so you know outside of that if you have a uh glass one you know what you can do is actually glass or plastic you can just drill a hole and put one of those floats right inside of your sump you know yeah. so most people have plastic sumps so it's super easy yeah. but even if you have glass there's little glass drill bits for that kind of thing and so you know what you can do is put a mechanical thing in there so you know that thing is definitely in the water so it's susceptible to different things but like now even if the computer fails I have a mechanical thing that's that's gonna do that and that goes along with that flow lock thing and so I'll just re remind everybody what that is again it's a little teeny valve that sits on the water uh, anywhere that you they would normally be dry mm -hmm. has a cotton wad that's packed inside of it and if water ever comes by, it wicks into it and then pushes a valve up and it snaps up and closes the, you know, line to it. The RODI line, so yeah. So that's redundancy. So I have something that manually detects water. You know, you could also use something like an Apex like a, that has a, a water sensor or whatever to turn the thing off. Which is an interesting thing you've never seen in any of these ATOs really. What's that? That it comes with an a actual leak sensor. Oh yeah. You know, which isn't that hard to do. You know, so maybe uh, the ultimate super duper deluxe, a double ultimate 2019 will come with a leak sensor. <laughs> uh, but, you know, like uh, if you had a leak sensor, either manual or electronics uh, and a solenoid on it or mm -hmm. just a, you know, $15 valve that we're talking about. Mm. Uh, if you put a, a float valve, which is a 15 bucks on it, that thing, man, ex actually is pretty reliable. Just a normal old float valve. One of the things about a float valve is the more it fails, the harder it pushes, you know? So like it kind of redundancies itself. They're like the deeper oh, underwater yeah, it is, the harder it pushes. Yeah, that's true. So, and 
you know, I think I'm in relation to that. I'm going to skip forward. Um, so today, in a week, for those of you who don't know, every Friday we have a customer service meeting where I teach a learning session. We just, you know, pick a topic and try to dig into it as much as possible. And right at the tail end, we talked about our auto top-offs. And I asked the whole team, and okay, so you can't buy an oscillator. Which one would you buy? Yeah. Because if I didn't say that, they would all say oscillator. So uh, without that, you know, uh, do you remember some of the ones that people said? Uh, this one, this one was uh, only because I, I think mostly because it's new and we haven't uh, really used it before. So actually, this is one you tagged me in in, in Ask BRS TV uh, over on Facebook. Is uh, somebody asked if we if we've done a video on it, and I went and looked at the I went and looked at search the internet and YouTube's and seeing that. Uh, there's some videos out there that pretty much you know show what it is and what it does and and talk about what's on the box and uh, so I'm looking at uh, I'm, I'm playing with this currently in my office just kind of figure out some ins and outs uh, that haven't been talked about but uh, you know it's with optical sensors there's four of them there so there's a super low level a low level a uh, high level and a super high level so um, and now also I mean there's a built-in uh, from what I've been reading what I've been looking at there's built-in inside of these head units there's uh, built in, it learns how long it takes normally to fill up from super low level to upper level or to mm -hmm. level level. And if it runs after a while, if it starts running outside of that, it sings a little song and whistles at you. And yeah, so rather than 10 minutes to be in default in this it one, learns. You, it learns, uh, like it knows it's five minutes. And I don't know where the threshold is, but at seven it, per se, it would mm -hmm. turn off. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of cool to me, man. You know, you can't really see it probably in the camera here, but there are, you know, two little diamonds in here. Uh, and the way it works actually is the water level that it hits it, the laser shoots across it and bounces back off and goes back in. If there's no water, it doesn't do that. Right. And so there's uh, two little uh, dimples here, one here and one here for low. So you can get super low and, you know, low. Yeah. Uh, high and super duper high. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, that's a cool kind of way to do it, you know, and. I think the best part about oh, this yeah. one is uh, so we, we were talking about the, the auto water change because Auto Aqua does an auto water change system that's built into with its ATO. So that way, uh, if you're doing an auto water change, it, it tells itself not to run the ATO in the middle of an auto uh, water, water change. So that way it lets everything balance back out. Uh, and that's uh, something that they, they kind of took here too, is that uh, in order, for, so for that, uh, what I did a video on that one where you had to, if you wanted to upgrade your pumps, the, the pumps that are included with it, uh, you buy these uh, op these switch sensors that uh, Auto Aqua makes that you can plug into their head unit, then you can plug in any pump of your own. They include one in here, and they also include the RO solenoid valve if you want to run straight off of your RO unit uh, in here. You don't even have to use them if you don't want to, but they just throw them in there. So. That's pretty cool that you get all that stuff. Like it's definitely. I mean, use it or not. It? Use it or not. But uh, yeah, uh, Adam. Adam is on here. Adam will post a link to this Adam, one. This tell is, us how much this thing this is. This is the ultimate. <laughs> it's the ultimate one, Adam. Make, well, because that's a lot of features, bucks, man. Of if you can come so. with a, if you can come with a pump, you can come with outlets. You can do your own pump. Yeah. Come with the solenoid. Like uh, it comes with everything you ever want to do with that thing. Other than a leak detection sensor. Yeah, Super Ultra Deluxe 2019 yeah. big sensor. <laughs> now, uh, yeah, I don't know, man. That's pretty awesome. You know, one of the other things that uh, came up in today's meeting, though, is uh, I asked around, and number two most common, if you can't buy an oscillator, what would you use? Uh, that right after this thing? Gravity? Yeah, it was a gravity and a float belt. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, like, you know what? I can't fault that, you know, because it's 15 bucks. You know, and so basically, you know, for a lot of people, our top off is they're just going to put a container that's over the top of the sump mm -hmm. uh, and put it into a float valve, and the float valve will add water as needed. Uh, you know, the two things there is a you can make the container so it isn't big enough to matter if it you know failed catastrophically. Right. Uh, and the two, I mean, I've been doing this a long time, man, and I have never seen one of these float valves fail. So I know it happens; it has to. Uh, yeah. But like I don't trust them emphatically like it's just a float valve with a little rubber seal in there so like how long can it last honestly I've never found out like I've never found the end where it doesn't work anymore so I'm super nervous to like say that to anybody like yeah go ahead and just use a float valve and don't worry it'll never fail you because it, it's never failed me hmm. uh, but well, I don't know, man. I don't well, know. that's a, uh, you may, it brings up a good point, though. Is there's we have two different types of flow valves. That, the horizontal ones that we carry, uh, one is fixed that doesn't, uh, mm -hmm. and the other one has a nut on it, like a wing nut, and you can adjust whether it points this way, whether it points this way to meet whatever you know whatever you're doing. Maybe you have an angled tank 
uh, that's got an angled panel and you got to turn that float switch up like this. That might be the way it goes. Um, but you know, with that, there's uh, with that wing nut. That's just a point. That's just a, a point with a possible potential failure. Uh, that's so failed. I think I think you always yeah you you mentioned that it's failed. People lose the wing nut and stuff like that. I mean, get bumped around or what have you, or just the just the float moving up and down loosens that nut over time, and then uh, just end up with leaky it's floor. It's this kind of thing that like you just never check. You yeah. know, so like uh, what's happened to me, man, is, you know, I've gone in there, you know, with, I thought I wanted an adjustable one because it's adjustable. I get, you know, adjustments. Yeah. Uh, but in reality, man, like I go in there and I'm scooping water out into my other bucket and I hit it and it like it's bent down yeah. or bent up and then I manually adjust it back. And it loosened the nut, and I just wasn't paying attention close enough. So, you know, when I did that, you know, all of a sudden the thing eventually just goes all the way up. And it will eventually stop if you have enough room still, even all the way up. But, like, for me, I would never, ever, ever use an adjustable float valve unless I had a legit need for it. Hmm. Like, if I had a need to add a failure point because somehow it's going to benefit me or my tank, I'll add the little wing nut in there and allow the adjustable float valve. But if I don't need it, why am I adding a failure point to this thing? And I'm not talking failure like today or tomorrow. Uh, it's one of the things I always try to drive home. I want a 10 year successful reef tank. So I want something that's not gonna fail me between here mm. and uh, 3,600 days from now. <laughs> or wait, 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 or, uh, yeah, something like that. So like uh, many, many days from now, man. Like, I really want this thing to last me take care of my tank for me man so no wing nut unless i need it i think we uh, the gravity one if, if you guys aren't uh, following kind of what this looks like um, we did this on the wall of test tanks over here uh, in the you know in our brs tv investigates where ron built this you know this rack that had like a 10 10 20 gallon reservoir up on top ran all of the lines to all of the tanks and then they all fed on float valves and gravities uh, now he had a special acrylic box made mm -hmm. that uh, went that encapsulated i mean it had slits on the side of it so it kept any moving quandary and critters away from that because this was we're relying on mechanical float and that's it to, to keep these tanks topped off so if any one of them were to fail uh we're talking like filling up the whole 20 gallons plus straight off of the rodi line we so, got fast machines here yeah too, man. yeah and, yeah 500 gallons per day systems and stuff like yeah, that the weekend could man, it'd be a thousand gallons of water on the floor yeah yeah, so yeah, so we, uh, for those float valves, the biggest failure point for me is probably, mm. you know, salt creep kind of dissolves on its own, you know, uh, ebbs and flows and stuff. So I, I'm not as worried about that, even though it's probably one of the, the biggest ones. It's snails, man, like rogue critters, like you said, man, wandering around, oh, yeah. getting in there, and uh, you know, or you know, if there's any light down there, algae growing on the seal, mm -hmm. you know, so you've got a refugium down there, or maybe you got. Uh, yeah, like any type of light that you could grow any calcifying algae on it or anything, uh, maybe a fanworm or something. Uh, so yeah, man, I'm uh, absolutely. I'm picking out a couple questions here right, that we had. I think. Uh, oh, this ultimate is ATO is uh, 199 bucks. So actually, ah, about the go. same price, man. As an oscillator. Yep, yeah. it comes with all the little extra features and stuff. I yeah. mean, I'm sorry. I'd probably swap. So open and honest, I'd probably swap the pump out myself. I mean, it's got an eight foot head. It's a, you know, 200 and it's a tiny uh, little guy. 74 gallons per hour, which is, you know, I'm not sure what the, uh, the oscillator boasts as far as like flow rates, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be more than what that little pump puts out. So for maybe, a, you know, a fairly small tank, like uh, maybe 50, 60 gallons or so, this would probably be a good, idea, you know, a good one, that pump, as long as you uh, don't, try, you're not trying to push like five feet ahead. Uh, this is something I'm going to kind of throw into that video that I'm going to put, put together for Aspirus TV too. Um, but because they give you the option to include your own ACE, uh, switch outlet and then put your own pump on, Probably what I would, I would end up doing anyway. So, all right, well, we got uh, some questions here. Doesn't let's answer one of them. Yeah, I'm trying to. I guess we can't to get this on here. I don't know what's going on, but uh, mm. uh -oh. this is the last day that we're going to run this. I think <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll let the guys behind the camera run them. Interesting. All right, so uh, I'll just answer some questions yeah, here, man. We can't see them. Uh, but, uh, Next purchase from my tank that is cycling ATO or BRS mini bioreactor. Uh, so you're, I don't know if it's a bio, for a mini, you're probably talking carbon or GFO. ATO, man. Uh, so the big thing for me is uh, remove work. 
you know, from the system and like points of lazy failure. Okay. So, you know, one of the biggest things is, is uh, controlling all elements is making sure that, uh, you know, salinity stays the same because salinity is all elements and hauling around buckets of water, man, every day, topping it off every day. Mm. That's for the birds, man. So like I have personally, I would select an ATO before a carbon reactor and I would just throw a bag of carbon, you yeah, know, in for there sure. for sure. Uh, I like this one, uh, and I don't know if uh, Carlos can throw some of these questions up there, but uh, which ATO, this is a really good one, which ATO for large aquariums would you recommend? Now we're talking like several thousand, maybe 500 plus gallons, 600 plus gallons. For 2,600 gallon That one's 2,600 gallon tanks. I well, so, you know, <laughs> <I was> oscillator, <laughs> but you know, here's the thing with then. So with the oscillator, what you need to do is put the cup of a thing called a the switch. water controller. Yeah. No, it's a switch socket outlet. Ah, true. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. That's so wrong. what you'd probably do is change out the switch socket outlet, which instead of turning on a uh, pump on and off, allows you to plug in your own pump. Which you'd need a pretty robust robust pump, probably. Yeah, for a 2,600-gallon tank, I mean, I don't know how much you're evaporating a day, but it's probably pretty significant. Mm. It's probably not as much as you'd think because it's still based off a of surface area. Yeah. You know, it's not and like, it's slow throughout the day. It's not like in an hour it's going to drop like this. It's going to be a steady loss of water. So, I mean, the, the pump, I would imagine, wouldn't have to be massive, but, you know, substantial enough. Hey, yeah, well, other thing, man, honestly, you got a 2,600-gallon tank, uh, I would buy the one that, when asked at, at BRS, the entire customer service agent's team said, I have to remove that option for them to even discuss anything else. That's, yeah. uh, you know, like, like I'd pick that one because, you know, I, I, I often go to the team, man, because, you know, I, I you know, play with everything known to man, right? Mm -hmm. And I get my own opinions just like you guys. And, I, you know, I, I get to test all the things against each other, which is nice. But what I don't get is, you know, touch point on thousands of them. You know, how many like thousands of these things work and how long do they work? The customer service team here does. So, oh, yeah. you know, this is uh, by far the biggest customer service team of uh, in our industry. It had the most touch points with the most people using this stuff. So, you know, probably by like a magnitude of two to three. So, you know, in that neighborhood, man, uh, we get to see, you know, from them, what things actually work and what fails people the most. And so when all of them all raise their hand for something, like, oh, well, that's because that one isn't giving them a hard time on the phones every day. <laughs> yeah. Especially if it's the one that we sell the most of, which is definitely the oscillator. You know, actually, the oscillator is interesting, man, because normally, you know, you got your different price points of something. And, you know, there'll be like a, you know, $60 option, $150 option, a $300 option. Mm -hmm. And in almost every case, the $60 option, you know, makes up, you know, half or more of the sales and is the number one seller. Uh, and then, you know, people, you know, put out more and more money for better solutions or whatever. In this specific case, the number one seller or is definitely the oscillator. And then two is actually the JBJ thing, I, I'm pretty certain. It may have changed in my last month since I looked, but you know, historically it's always been the little JBJ guy, which is like 70 bucks. And uh, he just works off two float switches, right? Carlos. Okay, Carlos. Here. Uh, and so it just works off a couple of uh, float switches, but you know what, man? We sell like 10 to one, these things over the JBJs. Mm -hmm. And so there just happens to be like a couple of things where like almost everybody's like, you know what? I just don't want to buy the thing that doesn't work. You know, yeah. uh, another thing that we hadn't talked about is kind of like a DIY auto top off that you can build. Mm. Like the Neptune breakout box when uh, some people were talking about building their own auto top offs. Uh, and there's a couple, you know, there's a couple other things. If you want to, I mean, if you're really crafty and you trust your electrical skills against one near water and things like that, there's some out there you can use relays and switches and you know float switches and you can kind of build you can really build one out like a like you know on a rector set type of auto top off um i almost trust I the guys that do it on their own but or manufacturers that do it for the hobby specifically but uh with the a with the neptune uh apex with the breakout box uh, you can, you know, there's six switches that you can do. So now you, and they have, I mean, there's float switches, mechanical float switches that you can plug into this thing. Now they have optical sensors also that you can just plug in and use anywhere you want to. So you can almost build your own combination of uh, mechanical float switches, optical float switches. Uh, you can put your own pump. You can use a, the, they have the solenoid. I mean, you can really build out your own based around your apex. Too, well, they so. more or less did that with the ATK. Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, but, you know, one of the things I'll just share about the do-it-yourself uh, solutions out there, 
there is like with the apex you can get around this to some degree but mm -hmm. they turn on and off with the water level so like uh, and most of them have some kind of relay to you know lower the power level that's in the tank mm -hmm. uh, and make sure you don't have full 110 going through it and so what happens is you know if the water is super super flat and like your sump or whatever it goes down a little bit and it will like click on and on and off if you have any water movement, it's like click, 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 click. And, yeah. you know, and like, so uh, one of the things that people complain a lot about is they click and turn on and off your do, do yourself solutions a lot. And I can tell you, I owned one from like autotopoff.com. And like, I always want to see if that place still exists. Oh, yeah. But I bought my first one from autotopoff.com and uh, it was a little float switch guy. It was super cheap. And then uh, also, we sell them the Aqua Hubs. Yes. So. Yeah. Aqua Hub is real cool. You just screw in a bunch of screws into a couple of float switches and it has a little relay plug-in thing in there. And I think it's like 40 bucks. It's so super it's, cheap. Yeah, this is definitely the cheapest option. You could you know, DIY really easy. Uh, but no, you need to put it in an area that does not have a lot of water movement or be okay with click, 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 click. Yeah, so, well, I mean, well, along with that is, sure, I mean, it clicks and you know, so, I mean, basically you're just, more or less, you're probably, wearing on the life of your pumps a constant on and on off and on and off and on uh the relay itself could fail you know things like that i so i'm a little weary i'm weary about it, diy ones like i don't uh, it depends on your investment in your tank true one thing i could say is you can get around that a little bit it, you know instead of using like an aqua lifter or something for dosing the water real slow to the tank with your auto top up you could use like a maxi jet which will like you know put a spurt of water mm -hmm. in there and get it the float uh, up above the line or you could put it in you know into the return pump area so it takes a little bit longer to raise into the tank go down the overflow and you know try to put it the, the sensors in the and the pumps in different areas to stop the you know turn on and off real hmm. fast there's a lot right. of questions about this since salinity is part of this too is um, and i'm seeing it's what's the what's the salinity you go for where what's what's the average salinity i think pretty much across the in the hobby unless you're doing something like a brackish water tank or maybe you're trying to do you know hyper hypo hypo or hyper salinity for some kind of fish treatment which is you know here or there but for the most part like 1.02 is 5 1.026 yep right in there yeah i mean 30 35 parts per thousand i think that's that's all you really should have to aim for and then like ryan always hits on is you know simple or a sta stable and stability just find a way to keep it there and you won't have to worry about it. Yeah, one of the things, man, I'm just going to go out and say too, uh, and not everybody will be happy with me for saying this, but I, like, I just don't trust the salinity monitors at all. Like, Oh, it, the probes? Yeah, all those probes and stuff. For me, mm. they just, like, when I say I don't trust them at all, I, I, I would say I trust them to tell me when something's way out of whack. Right. Right? Massive right. swing. Ma massive swing. I just wouldn't. Or, or like or trending swing. trending one way or another yeah. I just wouldn't trust it to uh, control a piece of equipment mm -hmm. you know because little air bubbles and stuff something as simple as an air bubble can throw it off uh, but I, you know it'll let me know when things are you know going on wrong uh, but I, I would like as far as a you know salinity monitor or whatnot I would trust like my my refractometer or you know digital refractometer a hundred times before I touch and trust the you know digital thing. I know there's some digital hmm. pens out there. Uh, oh yeah, Ice Cap makes one that's pretty cool. Temperature and salinity, just like scoop it in and push the button. It's kind of neat. yeah. You know, so there's a like they're electrical. You know, I, I think mm -hmm. Milwaukee just came out with one. The EC or yeah, the I, EC versus yeah. I don't know. I, I asked Zach man why we didn't stock one of those recently, and he said because he tested them and they just uh, weren't consistent. Enough. Oh yeah. Uh, and I don't know which one it was hmm. yet, uh, but it, it maybe the Hanna one is really awesome. I don't know. Uh, it, but like, that's been my experience too. It, and people are using these things; they trust them. So, yeah. like, you know, you know, that's one of the nice things, I guess, about you know, you know, if we don't stock it here, there's a reason. Yeah. Like, <laughs> if, if if like, I mean, we we want to make money, like the best the, everybody else in the universe. Right. You know, uh, I want to make sure that Randy gets his paycheck. Uh, Randy, do you want it? Uh, yeah, please. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, you know, uh, here's the thing, man. Is like, uh, you know, I know for sure people are gonna buy, you know, EC pens or whatnot. Mm -hmm. it, 
but that ain't good enough, man. So Zach's always, you know, testing all the stuff and making sure, you know, that it actually works and why sometimes, man, we are not first to sell stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, you know, quite the opposite. So, yeah, I don't know. I guess I, I just wouldn't test those things. Trust them. I trust the digital refractometer and the refractometer the most. So, and since we're on that topic, too, of refractometers, we're talking, you know, uh, hydrometers, uh, handheld refractometers, digital refractometers, EC pens, conductivity. Uh, what what do you trust the most? I mean, like, I, I like the, the, the digital refractometer, man, because it... You know, senses. I think it senses temperature uh, automatically. It's correct for it. Yeah. Yeah, and it gives me stable readings that I can test against my my uh, solution as well as RO water, mm -hmm. and it gives me a digital readout. One of the reasons that like the you know refractometers you look through aren't always my favorite. Is just because you know I can kind of lift up the lens a couple of times, and sometimes it's a little different than the other times. And you got to make sure you mm -hmm. waited long enough. You know, the auto correction is that you know more or less that this thing is you know heavy enough that it's you know correcting the temperature of the solution to itself. You know, based on the temperature of the room, which is you know generally around oh, 70 okay, degrees or whatnot. So you know they're pretty good. Hydrometer, garbage, man. Never. Uh, especially the swing arm things. And the, you know, the swing arm ones, the biggest problem is they get little air bubbles attached yeah. to them, you know, and just like clicking, 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 trying to get it to work. Well, a lot of times, too, yeah. that if they use, yeah, some of them I've seen use like a metal rod or a pin that holds the swing arm on, yeah, which yeah, can rust. get crusty and rusty yeah, all like the time. Yeah, any you know. friction at all, yeah. it's garbage. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I don't know. I guess the floater ones would be okay, except for like, when we're going to throw this thing and watch, turn off all Spin my pumps, it's so super stable. Yeah, like, it's, it's just, you know, uh, well, you have to get a sample and pull I, it out. There's no way, there's no reason I would do that. I don't think so. so yeah, I, I guess I would go refractometer and then or digital refractometer. You got the cash, but you know that's one of those things. Like you know, uh, it's a long ways away from here. But like those things are usually on sale like Black Friday. It's a perfect gift to yourself. I bought my yeah. first one at Black Friday. Yeah. Well before I worked here. Yeah, um, because like it's just like it's not necessary right it's yeah. just a total fluff thing but like once you've dropped a couple drops in and hit the button you're like oh 1.026 i'm done or not a little less you know i can go change it or whatnot uh it's just so much easier yeah you know and like there's something just so gratifying about a digital number <laughs> yeah you know, like I, I don't know you know so it feels more accurate though even though it may not be so yeah uh all right uh is the oscillator nano good enough for a nano tank so one of the things about the Osmolaner Nano, man, is like it shares the same name, but Jesus. there's no optical sensor on it. It's just moving part and timer now. Yeah. So, no, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know, man. Like I, it wouldn't be the one I'd buy now. You know, yeah. like the name's nice, you know, uh, because it's attached to a good na to a name that's been trusted for decades. But yeah, I just like. There's various qualities of Ford too, man. Like I, I don't know, like I don't, I don't know, like just because it's got a name that you may trust on it. I don't know if you trust Ford or not, but like uh, Pinto yeah. was a thing. That <laughs> <laughs> uh, was a thing, wasn't it? Uh, so like, yeah, I don't know, man. Like, no, I I don't think they're the same thing, man. And so if I was gonna go Nano. I mean, I, I might still use that, but I wouldn't expect the same results out of it. Oh, ja, uh, Jason today told uh, the one oh. that when I think of Nano, his option for if you can't use the Osmolator, uh, what what ATO would you use? He actually said the Auto Aqua, the little tiny micro one, and that's the one that you magnet between the, the sides of your sump or the side of your tank, and it optical through the glass optical senses the water level and then runs a little pump off of that. It's like one little sensor, one little this. He said that one was... Uh, Pretty decent for him has been. Yeah, solid. there was actually three or four people. It's that an said optical that one. sensor versus a mechanical switch. So, single sensor, Still timer, single sensor, sing yeah. songs to you. I think it does. It does, man. It <laughs> sings like like I have a Samsung washer and dryer, man. It sings me songs every time it starts <laughs> up and it's done. This thing does too. Yeah. Uh, but you know, this is my problem with that thing. Uh, I call it the roundy. Uh, with the problem, my problem with the roundy, man, is a sensor is only good as its ability to stay put. Mm. You know, so this single little sensor that, like, you know, only takes the slightest bump to come off, man, mm. or get moved up or down, uh, is a failure point to me. Yeah. So it absolutely works. You just, like, can't bump it and let it fall off. Tape it. That's one of the things I like about this guy is the magnets the are pretty strong. Massive. Yeah. yeah. So, like, you watch know, your fingers strong. Yeah, I mean, it, the, the, <laughs> I mean, magnets are expensive, actually, you know, so it's uh, one of the you know, more expensive things, especially because this one comes with two, mm -hmm. so you can have different the heights for them. But 
Yeah, I don't know. Hmm. All right, man. Uh, uh, I like there was a question on here. Um, I probably can't find it now, but they were wondering how often you should uh, calibrate the refractometer. So, I mean, for the digital one, uh, I always, because uh, I used to keep this thing next to like a 40 gallon brute trash can, and I'd dump salt. I never knew how much salt to put in, but I'd dump some in, and I'd come back in like half an hour, and I'd just put some drops on there and test it, and like, oh, okay, it's not enough yet. But I'd constantly do that, and then I'd rinse it with RODI water and then walk away, and then maybe like two weeks later, I'm back to doing it again. But with the push, you know, you take some RODI water, which is already right there. You drop some in there, you push the read or you push the read button, then you push the zero button, and I just calibrated it. Because it calibrates to RODI water, which is really nice. Uh, you can't, and this has been a, a, some, you know, some problem too, is that Milwaukee doesn't recommend, nor should you, uh, calibrate it with calibration solution. Uh, at 1.025, they say do it at, uh, do it with RODI water. Um, and then there's like a, some variance in there on you know plus or minus what have you. But uh, as far as the, the so every time I would come to use it, I just go ahead and uh, and you know go ahead and, and calibrate it because it's two button pushes. But for the handheld, uh, I know some people if you take care of it and you don't bump it around and you make sure that you clean it with RODI water and you clean salt creep off of the the flap and off of the the lens itself. You use a soft cloth that's you know clean and doesn't have debris on it. Uh, I think, and you store it properly without bumping it. I think a lot of people go like maybe a, a, upwards of a month or so without refer, without calibrating it. So I, I take a different approach to calibration, uh, and I test against a known solution. If it gives me the right answer, I don't need to calibrate. So it could be a month, could be a year. Yeah. So like with the pH probes too, like we talked about, I think last week. Oh, yeah. uh, I don't necessarily need to recalibrate my probes every uh, mythical three months or whatever. What I need to do is put them in the seven. Mm -hmm. If it reads seven. It's good, you know, especially if I take it out and put it in the 10 and it reads 10. Like the, the recalibrating is now more likely to screw it up than it is to make it better because it's mm -hmm. already accurate. Yeah. So the same thing with the refractometer, you know, like all kinds of different things can get in there. Like uh, just a little bit of salt water uh, could be residual sitting somewhere on there and, you know, change the, you know, concentration of the solution. Mm. That's actually one of the things that I found you know, when I was first started reefing, I like, why is this thing off, man? And then I go and put some more drops on there and all of a sudden it drops again. You know, like, why isn't this giving me consistent results? And the reality was, is I didn't clean it off before. Mm. And so there was a fine mist of uh, dehydrated salt on the lens and on the uh, unit. And so when I put the drops on top of the lens, Rehydrate. it was rehydrating uh, the, yeah. the uh, salt that was on the lens and my readings were off. So when I figured out that I was being dumb uh, <laughs> and I started rinsing it off before and after taking my test and, and cleaning off the surface, all of a sudden I get stable, stable. results out of it, yeah. you know. Hmm. So, you know, that's important. Cool. Uh, but yeah, I just tested against, you know, and there's a good question in here about like, do you test it against, uh, you know, RODI water or zero, or do you test it against something like uh, 35 yeah. parts yeah. per million solution or mm -hmm. thousand solution? And, uh, you know, both, are good enough, you know. I, I would say, you know, I, I would prefer to test against a range that I'm actually in. You know, and that's why you test your pH probe. You know, you don't calibrate it to a packet right. solution of, of one, of four. Or fourteen, or yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You do it in the range. So our our uh, tanks are at you know in the eight range usually, low eights. So we do it to seven and ten. You know, which is kind of in the middle there. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't do four and seven because four is so far away. The accuracy is going to be off. So at, uh, when we calibrate, you know, the refractometer, if we calibrate to zero, you know, it could be off at the higher range. You know, will it be off drastically in a way that like catastrophically messes up your tank? No, no way. But if I have an option, like I would absolutely do it the right way. Yeah. You know, so, you know, uh, and especially with the refractometer, like digital one too, like I don't really like doing it against zero in that case. I'll definitely use the refractometer solution. Hmm. Uh, I don't know. Do we call it refracto juice or we, not? I, don't I think know. I, internally. At one point in time, I think we had it labeled uh, refracto juice. We had Brightwell make us some uh, beam bulk resupply uh, refracto juice, but yeah, I'm not sure if it's still called refracto. I don't know, that's juice. the best stuff. But refracto same thing. juice. I mean, it, uh, and that said too, you can uh, you can get those, and, and usually those bottles last people like forever. Uh, you can make your own solution too. I think Zach's made some of his own standard solution before here for us, but. All right, man. Well, can maybe you can scroll these comments for us a little bit, Carlos, and we see if we can find another couple questions, man. We got about 14 more, 50 more minutes or so in here. 
Got to use your T-shirt for cleaning. I mean, I guess. I have, you know. soft, I have good soft <laughs> T-shirts. Uh, I would trust my T-shirt. Uh, I, I calibrate mine every time here. Uh -huh. uh, all right, man. And you have to go pretty far down, I think. Okay, there's one here. Uh, hi, Ryan Randy. I got a question uh, out of topic. That's all right, okay. fine. Uh, would you help me with, I have a 100-gallon uh, display tank and a 50-gallon sump. And the question just, oh, there it is. where is it? Right here. Uh, uh, Elk is 12, calcium is 320. What's the solution? Oh, man. That's big. All right, yeah. So the only way to reduce alkalinity, I mean, adding calcium is super simple, man. You go to the buy some calcium chloride uh, or, or your favorite calcium solution. Mm -hmm. I think really the best is probably just, you know, some BRS calcium chloride because then you can use the calculator and put in 320, you want 420, fix it, you know. Calcium, changing the amount of calcium in there usually doesn't show any you know, signs of distress. Uh, the alkalinity, however, of 12, uh, you got two options, man. You can let it, if you got a decent consumption, you can just kind of let it fall. Stop dosing any alkalinity yeah. and just kind of let it fall on, it, on its own. Uh, or you can do water change. So if with you did a, with a lower concentration salt of yeah. alkalinity, oh yeah, you got to use. There it. are salts out there with 12 dKH. Yeah, if you use black bucket red sea, it's 12. You just change it out, it'll still be 12. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so true. if you found something that was eight, but you got to be realistic, I could do a 30 percent water change with eight and On 12 gallons, and it's going to drop like a point. Yeah, it's, you know, so it's minimal. Yeah, it's not going to not going to be dramatic, man. So, uh, and 12 is probably not going to hurt anything so i would probably just let, let it fall on its own yeah yeah so uh, uh off topic. reef juice has a good one here uh when running the rodi direct it's a very bottom one there carlos uh when running rodi direct to the tank do you find a much of a difference in ro membrane lifespan also with uh, big fills over tiny fills would the cup would that couple of gallons affect salinity on say the brs 160. Okay, so uh, uh, the membrane, membrane I shouldn't. Spread. I don't think it should have any effect on the membrane because mm -hmm. it's just turning on and off. Uh, and, you know, the membrane, I mean, I guess you're going to see probably some TDS creep that goes through it and it might precipitate a, a little bit more. Uh, we haven't noticed that here. Uh, and so mm -hmm. it probably is going to depend on, you know, how filthy your water is so if you have super 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 hard water and you don't soften it at all uh, you're probably actually going to have some increased precipitate on the other side of the membrane due to do TDS creep these membranes last a really long time though so you know this is like you know people really think about the membrane a lot but honestly when the membrane lasts you know it costs like 40 bucks and can last three years yeah. so you know if it lasts two years like uh, I don't know. I, I will I pay will the never. twenty bucks to not have to put water <laughs> in my tank, uh, you know, every day. If, yeah. if I if, if I could say right now, would you pay twenty bucks to never ever top off your tank in the next two years? Yeah, like for sure. <laughs> so like, uh, yeah. The big thing though is usually actually the complaint is to you it consumes DI resin. Mm -hmm. uh, that one's accurate. Yeah. And so what will happen uh, uh, in a TDS creep? For those of you who don't know. Uh, when you hook it up directly to your tank, you know, the float is turning it on and off mm -hmm. uh, uh, quite a bit, right? It's just putting out little bits of water because it comes out pretty slow. Yeah. And when it turns off, then TDS creep happens. And so on the on one side of the membrane, you may have like 300 TDS and the other you have three, right? And it just naturally wants to balance. And on a yeah. long enough timeline, you'd end up with 150, 150, right? right? And so, but in the next hour, it's probably going to go from three to six, right. right? So if it does that, I am now gonna cut my DI resin lifespan in half, right? And so you're gonna use a lot more DI resin if the thing's turning on and off all the time. So there's a couple of ways that you can manage that. Uh, you know, you can set it up to, you know, only be on for certain portions of the day. So mm -hmm. like, uh, uh, I think a good one is just to put it on a solenoid, uh, either on like Apex or like just a solenoid and a, and a timer. Mm. And I can do the math, you know. I can go measure my RO system. It should do about three gallons an hour, you know, at 75 gallons a day. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, is like, you know, most people's water is super cold, uh, especially in the winter, and you might actually do three gallons an hour. So what you could actually do is say, hey, my thing evaporates, you know, or it produces actually two gallons an hour, and I evaporate a gallon a day. Well, I can go set up a timer to only turn the RO system on for and open up that solenoid mm -hmm. for a half hour a day, right? Yeah. Or like 10 minutes longer than I need, or even double it, right? 
So, but at least it's going to turn on into a vast majority of its dose. Uh, it. yeah. In fact, I think I would probably do about twice as much as you think you need because you, you know you got a flow valve to stop. Well, it's summer; it's going to go faster. Ah, winter, true, you don't want to keep resetting this yeah, thing. Yeah. But like you know, if you do that, then you can save all your DI resin because it's going to do just one spurt, and it'll just happen once a day. Hmm. You know, if you care that much. You, you know? think? Uh, you think we have some. Digital uh, TDS meters that have like built-in volumizers and stuff in, into them, or volumizers in them no, as I think well. They canceled you that think, thing. Did they? The volumizer oh, guy okay. from HM. Darn. Yeah. And then, then you could write to have a digital readout of how much you're you're actually making, and then oh, make yeah. a calculation based on. Yeah, that. those things were designed to tell you like how often to change your carbon blocks, mm. and really you should change them out like based on you know uh, performance. Yeah. You know, measuring them with a chlorine strip. Uh -huh. Second, you should probably f measure them uh, based on the gallons you produce, which would be that flow meter. Yeah. And third, you should change them out willy-nilly based on the amount of magical time they've been there, uh, which has no meaning at all. And Neptune has a flow meter in the quarter inch, too. Oh, yeah, they do. So, so you, you actually do, do it flow. that way, too. Yeah. yeah. So, like, especially if you get the flow meter gets really handy if you, say, have tested your water with a little test strips and you found out, oh, you know what, I need to change out my carbon blocks every, you know, three months, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and in that period of time, I've used X amount of gallons. Well, you know what, I can do three months, I can do the gallons, I can get, you know, like a better uh, window into it tied together. But really the best way for your like carbon blocks and stuff is just to go get those little test strips are like seven bucks and uh, turn the system on, let it run for a little while and then just go put it in wastewater. the wastewater. Yeah. You know, the wastewater is water that's gone through the carbon blocks but not the membrane, right? And so just put it in there. If it's pink uh, and shows that there is uh, chlorine there, Time to, change, time to change them out, dude. They're not working anymore. Yeah, you know. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but you know, most people, you know, don't do that. They change Actually, them out willy-nilly. It's a good uh, Ask BRS TV short video on actually how to change out when to change the filters out so we've talked we've hit it a couple we've hit it on so many different levels in in longer videos like mm -hmm. eh, here here's one yeah well you just put it in a little t tidbit yeah, yeah like when to change huh. these things out uh yeah absolutely uh let's let, we got about nine minutes here there's a couple we want to hit real fast uh, from starting from the top one there carlos and then we'll just scroll them down that top one hey J you know we were talking about making your own calibration solution for uh salinity uh, Deluxe put, put one on there. Said if you Google Randy Holmes Farley DIY salinity, you get the reef to reef page with how to do it. That's pretty cool. Yeah, you know. <sighs> yeah, but I mean, the, I, this I, stuff I, is so cheap and it lasts you so long. Yeah, yeah I don't know I, if I, I don't know if I do it myself. Wow, I don't know, man. Like I, I, I'm, I'm all for DIY, man. And, uh, and Randy, block. man, has done amazing things for the hobby, and I bet you that is 100% accurate. Uh, I, I, I making ten. my own. I've got ten bucks. Yeah, I got, I got. I don't even think. I think it's like it's six less bucks. Than that, yeah, I got six bucks. And you know what? The six bucks thing too. It comes in a uh, little container with an eyedropper on it, so I can, you know, drop some out, close it, and use it again later. Because the only thing mm -hmm. you're really worried about is evaporation. Right. So if I were to make my own uh, do-it-yourself solution, but know that you got to better make it right because. You are now making a concentration of calcium alkalinity. Every element in your whole tank will be based on that thing being accurate. Mm, okay. Uh, and so I guess that would be my backup. Yeah. Is uh, if I made that do-it-yourself calibration solution for my refractometer, I would then make sure to test my alkalinity and calcium, make sure it's not way off, because I, ah. I make sure I didn't screw up or anything. True. Right. Uh, why does, this is a good another one uh, that you're probably going to talk about next week. Why does BRS not promote the balling method? Uh, you know what, man? Uh, I mean, the balling method is like more or less just almost BRS two part. Yeah. So like, uh, you're definitely gonna hear about it next Friday's video. Uh, and you know, the balling method is this. You have a container that is very clearly labeled calcium chloride. And then you have a container that is very clearly labeled uh, sodium bicarbonate and carbonate yeah. mix, which might as well be BRS two part, <laughs> right? True. Uh, and uh, then part C, is uh, a what they call sodium chloride free salt, which they should come up with a better name for because it's just confusing. Uh, what it actually is is a trace element solution, you mm -hmm. know, essentially. So I mean, it's kind of like uh, minor trace elements. So basically, it contains every other element uh, in the in the water in the same ratio as the calcium and the alkalinity, other than sodium and chloride. And so when you add all three together, it makes salt. 
right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it, you know, because you're dosing extra sodium and chloride with uh, the with part one and part two. With the, yeah, part yeah, one and part two. Uh -huh. So for those of you who don't know, uh, you can actually do like a hybrid method, and we're going to talk about that this week too. Yeah. And I got to be honest, after it's talking about it, I'm going to do it. <laughs> so you know, it's attractive, yeah. Because trace elements, you know, one of those things is you can be successful without them, and I know that because I've seen too many thousands of tanks with that with it. Mm -hmm. But uh, absolutely benefit, you know. So like, it will see, you know, metabolic benefits, man, to the, you know, coral's health, you know, the whole organism if you increase the quality of the nutritive environment, mm -hmm. you know. And it's like, uh, you know, do I feed like dollar ninety nine kitty mix, or do I go out and like shoot, you know? actual pheasants for my cat or something you know <laughs> like getting them the actual nutrients from eating the liver and the brain and the heart and whatever wow. the whole thing some feathers uh actually is definitely better than corn grain and kitty mix from dollar 99 store so you know like uh will a kitty mix keep them alive yeah probably for like a decade you know but yeah. will he be healthy uh and happy the whole time and i don't know it's a cat uh, yeah. but probably not the same you know and that's the same with all of us mm. so uh yeah man cool. uh, what Neptune Systems is here. Hello. Oh, hey, Probably Neptune. Terrence, maybe. Oh, but uh, yeah, back on that, that uh, three-part thing, man. So oh, yeah, I would absolutely method. use it uh, uh -huh. with uh, the Tropic Marine with it. It's super cheap. So all you got to do yeah. is to, to do do the hybrid method with BRS two-part and the balling method. All you do is just make up your own BRS two-part the same way you ever would. Uh -huh. And then make part three, which is yeah, yeah part three, which is this the C, the balling method, which uh -huh. is seven and a half scoops uh, of the the part C yeah. into a gallon of water, and you dose the exact amount of part C as you would A and B the same way, and now you're dosing trace elements mm -hmm. with your BRS two part, and, and you said the box makes like up to five gallons. Yeah, it makes five gallons. So it's, it's a super 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 cheap, expensive too. three dollars. <laughs> yeah. So you can now dose trace elements uh, with your BRS two part for three bucks for a gallon of solution because yeah. fifteen bucks makes five. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm in. I mean, like that for me. I, you know, trace elements. It's just big mystery. Blah blah blah. But you know. At some point, man, the, the cost of it is hmm. so low, I don't need to see miraculous results to justify three bucks. You know, uh, I don't. Does that, and so talking about that, so now, I mean, if we're doing a dose that, the same amount that we do, the, uh, the alkalinity and calcium, and then we're talking about another, we're talking about another jug and we're talking about a third dosing pump. You definitely need a third dosing pump. And then how do we, how do we approach magnesium? Just a hand dose? Because I don't yeah. think you even, you don't need it. You know, that's a good a question, pump. actually. So in general, I never dose magnesium with a pump. Never. So the I only thing I ever do is I, I test it occasionally and fix it because the How tank important. has never shown any difference to me whether or not it is uh, 1320 or 1360. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know the difference in 40 points that high proportionally is so little. And, I, and it doesn't consume it at the same metabolic rate as like calcium or whatnot. Yeah. So I just like, I just never concerned about it. So I don't find the need to dose it in small amounts every day. I just fix it when it gets out of whack. Mm -hmm. That said, you know, one of the things we weren't sure about was if that part C actually contains magnesium oh, or yeah. not. And you know what, if it does, uh, then I probably don't need to fix it very often. If As it often, doesn't, yeah. then I'll just fix it when I need to. I would not have a fourth dosing pump for it. So yeah, you get three dosing pumps. You know, a lot of pumps out there have three dosing heads anyway. Uh, and you can do your trace elements with part C and then calcium and, and uh, with the calcium chloride and the soda all ash. All pharma grade, all three, right? Yeah, you know, that's the one thing too, man, about like, the, I haven't tested the, the Tropic Marin one, but you know, I, we saw the pharmaceutical difference, you know, in all of our testing and we did the ICP MS mm -hmm. testing. Like, like I'd say, not just a difference between the pharmaceutical grade and the pet grade and the other grade, but like a giant chasm of difference, you yeah. know? So especially if it's only like a couple bucks difference, like, I don't know why, why you could debate, you know, like, does it really matter if there's a, you know, 3000 parts per million silica in my Kalkwasser? I don't know, but for a buck, if I'll just not find out, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, so, uh, I end the story there. Yeah. So yeah, so it's nice that if you want to use a Tropic Marin actually and use the whole Bali method together, and I just use their stuff, uh, they sell it in sets. It ain't actually, it's probably, I would put it on the uh, below midpoint in terms of overall cost. Definitely not as cheap as bulk, uh, you know, BRS Pharma, but it's 
way, 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 way cheaper than things like the Red Sea and the Triton and stuff. Yeah, and I think it's more concentrated too because you use nope, not no, no, not more. It's, it's actually less. Same, less concentrated. Less concentrated. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, that's why actually, if you do the balling method, and I think it's because they mix the sodium chlor or sodium carbonate and with bicarb, bicarbonate is yeah. why it can't be as potent. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I think in in that case, you only use like three scoops if you're gonna uh, for their balling method. And that's why with ours, Seven. you use like, maybe it's three and a half or four. Okay. Yeah. You know what it is? It's four scoops for their, uh, their version. Seven and, and for us, us like seven and a half, I think. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, Huh. Seven. I, I don't know, our video, man, the next Friday. Man, <laughs> Watch for next it. Friday. Yeah. He's going to talk about it, drone on about it. For the days. other thing, man, is I guarantee I'm going to make him actually do a video on this because I think there's a yeah. lot of BRS two-part users out there that for three bucks for a gallon would start dosing to trace elements. To start dosing trace elements? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I would. Yeah. I never did it before. I was just two-part, so. There we go. All right, so uh, cool. it, we're going to wrap it up, man. It's 4 o'clock. And uh, uh, next Friday, I promise you, man, we are definitely going to be back in line. We've got the hybrid series. We've got all the elements. We're going to talk about uh, a bunch of different things. We're going to talk about all the different two parts out there. We're yeah. going to talk about calcium reactors, why uh, they're actually more simple and stable than you think. We're going to talk about uh, Kelkwasser for a uh, SPS tank. We're even going to talk about the carbocalcium and all free. For, for those of you who don't know, that's a one part. So. One jug has calcium, alkalinity, trace, trace elements. Uh, elements, minor elements, all in one jug. Same concentration one dosing is pump. two part. Same concentration is two part, That's but even one. better than that, it's in one jug instead of two. Right? <laughs> so, I, I mean, it's a little different. It's not like a miracle thing, but like uh, actually a really interesting uh, new approach. And I think you're going to see a lot of people doing it. Uh, again, some, some of you may have seen Zach's tank. You've seen the ULMs that are running it. So, uh, I don't know. Cool. All right, we'll uh, cut out here, man. Have a happy weekend. I guess we'll see you Monday for a different live. Another live. I don't yeah. know what we're doing. We'll we'll find something to talk about. All right, sweet. And we're gonna man. give some stuff away too. So. Oh yeah, Monday we'll give stuff away. Maybe. So hey, have 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 a happy weekend. All right, take care, guys. Peace.